fight and we don't have to kill everybody in the whole wide world really just needs to chill no we don't have to fuss no 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 we don't have to hello everybody welcome back to just chill with oliver george episode 25 the light is on the plexiglass is up my dad has a mask we're back in the studio it feels good um Amazing guest today, but before I get to that, I just want to say if you're watching this on YouTube and you want the audio only version, maybe to take jogging or something, check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and vice versa. If you're hearing this and you want to see the visual side of things, come on over to YouTube. Please subscribe on any platform. And if you want to contact the show, it's just chill podcasting at gmail.com. If you got a cool guest idea or you just want to say what's up. Now to the man of the hour. Uh, I can't even believe I get to sit down with you. I've been a big fan for a long time. Mr. Spencer Rice. I don't even know how to describe you because you got so many titles. You're a comedian, musician, director, actor, writer. Producer. Producer. Kind of a creative idiot. jack of all trades. I don't think you're an idiot, but. Um, you know, it's been hard on my career, believe it or not. When I was in Los Angeles, uh, I would go meet with, to try to get representation. And we were actually on Comedy Central with Matt and Trey from South Park producing. Yeah. And I couldn't get representation, and I couldn't figure it out. So this guy I knew, who was just sort of the the Hollywood genius wizard guy, who just understood the town and how it worked, and so he would say, "Well, tell me what your pitch meetings are like when you go meet a potential manager or an agent." And I would go in saying, "I'm all those things," and he said, "Well, that's right there the problem. They don't know who you are or what you are. You're all over the fucking place. You know? Yeah. They want the, the big titted blonde girl to come in." So this can, is what I do, yeah. That can pay cheerleader, or you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, Dude, I can relate to that completely. I, I dabble in everything. I, I'm doing stand-up one week and doing this show, and then I'll do a bit of acting. I, I don't know. Sometimes I think I'm afraid to commit or something to one thing, you know? No, I don't know. I just, I, to me, it's just my creative journey. And um, at this point in my career, I don't think I'm going to ever blow up to be, you know, a huge star, so I might as well do what makes I me happy. I would consider you a big star, but maybe that's because I'm a, a Canadian. I don't know how you guys fare on the rest of the planet. But. I, don't, I don't see myself. I don't think there's a star system in Canada, almost to Canada's credit. But um, That's know. true. But look, uh, the show, was I would say, was a cult more than a, a mainstream. Mm -hmm. Kenny versus Benny. Kenny versus Benny, we should say, for anyone who doesn't know yeah. who you are from that. You are one half of the infamous duo. Mm-hmm. Uh, Canadian comedy show ran from 2003 to 2010, I believe. If there's a uh, a brain scan and there's a part of my brain that is supposed to be responsible for chronology, it would be a big black hole. Oh, so really? I don't know. I, I it's I, I've never read about it being a, a real disorder, but I don't know time. Like I don't really. I can't tell you if something happened five years ago or ten years ago, basically. So that's all long term memory then, because you're great. I mean, you have to have time to play music, and you're obviously good at that. So your yeah. short term's all right. Yeah, I don't really think it's memory. It's timeline. It's chronology. I can remember. Yeah. I just don't know when it was. Huh. Okay. Well, I, I will get into Kenny versus Benny in a minute, but uh, sure. I wanted to start off. Normally, I, I try to go chronologically with these interviews, but in honor of your show tonight, let's talk about what you've been doing the last few years, which is rocking the blues scene. And uh, no, just, no, no, that's not true. Um, I'm basically I Kenny and I, my main gig uh, since we haven't been on television is working with Kenny doing a duo comedy live show, which we do. And we play pretty big rooms. Yep. Uh, musically, uh, I, I just sort of play bars, you know, like this place I'm playing tonight. You know, it, it, not the blues scene. You know, I'm not playing oh. it. Well, you know I, what I mean? you're still very talented is what I'm trying to say. No, a lot of people might I appreciate not know. That. No, I'm just saying that I'm not, I, I'm, I'm sort of outside of the the Toronto Blues Society scene and all that. I don't play those bars where, you know, Grossman's and all those places. I don't avoid them. It just, I, I, I couldn't agree with you that I'm uh, doing anything but just playing my music wherever I can get a paid paycheck. Or well, payday. you're very humble. Uh, because well, I, I mainly it's not about my playing it's about where I'm playing and and you know I, I, and the the problem is that uh, a lot of people come to see me because of Kenny versus Benny uh, they're not really into the kind of music that I play they really just want a selfie with me so it's Ouch. it's you know it's, so that's what I that's that's what I deal with right and I'm not complaining because I, I get people in the door just because they remember me from the TV show sometimes yeah. they're pleasantly surprised by the music sometimes they just really want a picture and they talk and you know it's it's just a it's a bizarre little uh uh you know uh thing that i'm in it's not 
traditional in any kind of show business sense, but it, I'm just a working entertainer and I just play wherever I, I can play, but I'm not all in music, I'm not all in comedy, I'm not all in TV, I'm just all over the fucking place. Yeah, that sounds like you've always kind of been like that, though. I think so, yeah. And it's to my detriment. Certainly it was when in L.A., you know? Yeah. Well, I mention it mainly because I think there's possibly some people who know you from Kenny vs. Spenny that don't realize you're even a musician. Most don't. Yeah. And, uh, and you're quite good. I mean, your slide guitar work is insane. I've been really impressed watching your Facebook videos and stuff. Um, so I did want to ask, I know you've been playing guitar since you were a kid. Yes. But I have not been able to determine when you really got into the blues. Uh, yeah. I saw an indie film you did from 92, uh, Nothing Anything, or Something Anything, right? Oh, wow, yeah. And that said Where did music. did you see that, by the way? Uh, YouTube. It's Found on it YouTube? On, yeah. And it said Music by Spenny at the end, which I suspected when I was hearing the bluesy guitar in the background. So yeah, yeah. you've been into blues at least since 92. But was there a, a certain... Again, I don't know numbers and times, but uh, what really happened was I... I had decided that I wanted to play music and be on the stage as opposed to an audience member. And, and I wasn't particularly gifted musically, but I have a really good uh, work ethic and discipline. So it took me a long, long, long time. Uh, and I got exposed to the blues when my mom moved to California. Uh, she was dating this guy named uh, Jeff Cooper who passed away recently and he was an actor. He was, uh, he was in David Carradine movies. He, he played uh, Dr. Elby which was the linchpin character in the Who Shot JR story. Oh, from yeah. Dallas. Yeah. He, so he got uh, Linda Gray under hypnosis in a therapy session, <laughs> and that was revealed Who Shot JR. Anyhow, he was, uh, he was a, mus mus a, a sort of wannabe music guy. Not, he was an actor. And um, he turned me on to a Heart Again, which is a, a Muddy Waters album. Oh, nice. uh, Muddy Waters produced song. by Johnny Winter, and so it was. It 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 was. It's a hard rock and blues album. So I was at the right age. I liked the rock part because I was into punk and the Ramones and all that stuff. And then you know, blues is just one of those things that it either grabs you or you don't care for it. Yeah, it seriously grabbed me to this day, and uh, that's basically how I got into blues. And then it just became a, a sort of an intellectual dive into the the history of it and where it came from so much history there yeah you know and the, and, and and then and then i saw <clears throat> there was used to, uh, used to be a bar in toronto called cafe on the park and uh, david carradine who was friends of jeff uh, asked me if i'd ever heard of a guy named john hammond so i never heard of him so i noticed that he was playing uh at this cafe on the park it was not a blues bar or anything like that but he was playing at a tiny little stage and he was a solo musician and he had he had three guitars he had a 12 string a regular six string and a steel guitar like I have. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he blew my mind. I went to every one of his shows. It was, he was there for three days and he did two shows a night. So you do the math. Yeah. And um, uh, he's probably my biggest influence. And he's won a Grammy subsequently. Sweet. Just, yeah. And his father, it turned out, because I got to know him, he was a gentleman. And, and I was just this little fawning guy who just wanted to meet him because his talent was so huge to me. And he had he had dinner with me, and you know, oh, and I had the David Carradine kind of in because he knew David. So, but he was super nice, and uh, I thought this is the coolest guy I've ever seen. He goes to the city, he's alone, doesn't need bass, drum, no rhythm section, nothing, and he leaves and he goes to the next town. Yeah, yeah. There was something really romantic about that. For sure. And that's what Dylan was at the beginning, right? Before he wanted to you know, go electric and hang out with his buddies and all that. Yeah, stuff. it was really folksy roots kind of guy. Yeah. And the, the the downside to that is uh, you, it took me years and years to, you know, develop enough that I could play, you know, three 45 minute sets solo because unlike when you're in a band and I'm also in a band, if you make a, a flub, it's, if, if people are paying attention, it's pretty obvious because yeah, you're, cause the, you're a unit. Yeah. You're, you're the guy. So, uh, so that took a long, long time, decades to get, to a comfort level that I could actually, but once I saw John Hammond, that path started for me. I just said, I got to learn to do this, which encompassed blowing the harmonica and playing guitar. You asked me about Yeah, that. I always thought that looked really hard. Yeah, just, you know, learning the music and understanding what my limitations were musically and working my way around it. And I'm okay, you know, yeah. it's, it's working. Well, that's definitely something I hadn't even thought about because there is something to be said about a band. It kind of works both ways. Like if you fuck up, everybody notices in the band but when a band is totally in sync you have that kind of camaraderie you know it's it's give and take but yeah you can get away with it a lot easier than, yeah then uh, and singing has always been my weakest point and it's just been a uh i just went in and i did a i guess a performance video recording which was really just so that uh, brandon 
He's yeah, our Brandon book, Bird, book yeah, manager guy, and so that he can show it to because they know me as a solo artist, not as a band. Mm -hmm. And uh, between the time that we shot that and today, I think my voice has improved twenty percent significantly. Nice. Well, it's nice, except you see the video and go, oh, why didn't I wait yeah, two yeah. weeks? But you Get never know up. when it's going to, you know, because I'm a slow learner. So it, it just, it, it, it just, it's just this ongoing thing, which I love. This, the growth, the improvement, the, yeah. you know, the fallbacks, how you deal with it. It's a real discipline. It's a lifestyle. It's a craft for me, you know? Well, and blues is nice in that sense that uh, where vocals are concerned, you can kind of have a not so mainstream golden voice and still sound awesome. You know, you can be like, ah, we're down. Well, to yeah. the you know? I mean, the, the music talent out there. Uh, professionals and, and otherwise, it's an, it's astounding, you know, how much musical talent there is out there. So, yeah. you know, you just have to just have blinders on kind of, you know, yeah. because I'm never going to sing like that guy on American Idol ever. Oh, it's easy to get intimidated for sure. Yeah. yeah but then yeah. you got to be you. You got to do your thing. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and you got to love blues because I found this quote from you. I thought was hilarious. We said, I picked the only form of music where women didn't come to the shows. It was just a bunch of drunk men. So you've got to really love what you're doing. And, and then the same almost applies for the TV show, Kenny versus Penny, you know. Uh, but we did end up sort of with a female audience, which was nice. But it's still a lot of, I still get a lot of that, you know, where it's just guys in the audience. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's the old Bro adage. Fest. Why do you get into show business to begin with to get laid and, you know. Yeah. That's kind of out the window, but but everybody thinks I'm gay. So, you know, are you married now? I thought you yeah, had a, married, your kid and I've stuff. Kids. Yeah, I've been divorced. The whole, you know. Hey, same here, man. I got three kids now, but I, I went through a divorce right uh, when that show we were talking about that you did uh, X rated yes. in 2013. That's probably why I didn't catch it because I was going through a divorce. So, right, right. kind of didn't go come up on my radar. Um, Actually, maybe we'll just talk about that now because I did really want to bring that show up. Um, in, in case anyone hasn't seen it, I don't know where they can see it. In I case anybody about in case anybody has seen it. Well, big fans of you, I'm sure, have seen it. Um, no, no, not even. I, no, I didn't even know it was on YouTube. Frankly, I yeah, don't wanna... it may not be anymore. My dad said that guy's account got pulled. Yeah. But anyways, it's a show X rated because yeah. the dude's name is Ray Wolf and. Uh, yes. He's a, quite the character. Kind of reminds me of like a Danny McBride sort of character. Yeah. Um, Except he's real. Yeah. Oh, that's a real. <laughs> That's sort oh, of. These aren't actors. Oh no, these are real people. Well, okay, That's so a documentary series. The only I thought it was a mockumentary. No, no, dude. I only asked because I know uh, Aaron Power. Uh, surprisingly, Aaron, Aaron Power is a stand-up, right? Yeah, he is a oh, comedian. Yeah, he was I, in it. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, but I thought this nice was just. How's he of, doing, by the way? Uh, I haven't seen him in about a year now. He okay. came through town. I did a show with him at Yuck Yucks uh, maybe a year ago. Mateo passed away. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, he's gone. I never met him. And Brianna, we knew as well because uh, my younger brother went to school with her, and she dated one of my brother's best friends for a couple yeah. of years. So yeah. it was really weird to stumble on this show, and I had all these connections. Can Canada's kind of like that. Yeah, oh, Ottawa. Ottawa, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyways, anyone who hasn't seen it, if you can find it, check it out. Um, I will talk about Kenny and Spenny a bit, um, but I wanted to know what you got you into comedy before that. Like, I, I heard you went to Second City and you did some no. stuff there. No, I don't know. People think that. Never. Well, um, I think no, I, my cousin Wikipedia Marjorie uh, Gross uh, was a really one of the first female stand-up comedians in this country. Um, and she worked at Yuck Yucks when they were starting out and they had a club on, on College Street, which was essentially a hallway with like a light bulb, you know, <laughs> it was Mark Breslin's extremely humble beginnings. Yeah. So I would just, she was like my hero. She got me into the Beatles. She got me into comedy and show business and movies and television. She was a freak for all that stuff. And she was older than me. And she ended up, she was a writer on Seinfeld. She wrote four Seinfeld episodes. So she was successful. She was a script doctor. Um, and uh, that's really was my inroad. So I would go to her shows and I'd be too young to get in, but no one seemed to care. Nice. And, uh, and that's sort of because of her, I'm pretty much could put it on her shoulders that why I'm even doing this. Made you want to perform and stuff. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, I, I do and she have passed away. Just oh, so you know. sorry to hear she's that. She's not around anymore, but uh, she's hugely influential. Do you know which Seinfeld episodes uh, she yeah, did? Yeah, she did uh, The Ass Man. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, she did uh, the one with Bette Midler uh, okay. with a baseball story. Uh, she did The Move. Okay. And I can't. I never can remember all four of them. I'll look them up on IMDb yeah, or something. Her writing partner was... Uh, oh, fuck. What's her name? Anyways, I can't think of it right now. Not Elaine Boozler. Uh, anyways. But that, were, oh, that's a, a super cool influence to have when you're growing up, though. 
She was, you know, she was amazing. She ran away from home basically and lived in New York City and she uh, worked at the Catch a Rising Star. Uh, they didn't have a license. Uh, they, they were gonna get closed down for fire insurance reasons unless they had someone with a flashlight who just stood in the hallway near the stage. And hmm. she did that. So she got to know everybody uh, that was a concerned contemporary comedian. Now, all those people are now the establishment. We're talking Seinfeld, Larry David. Uh, I mean, you name it, Jay Leno. Uh, yeah, they all, yeah, yeah, they all, they they all became. Shows. And I got to meet almost all of them. Wow. Well, I, Seinfeld I met with Kenny. That was nothing to do with her. But Richard Lewis I got to hang out oh, with. Oh, wow. Uh, Sam Kinison. And it was all just these, there was this group That's of nuts. comedians that all that all knew each other, so it was really cool. Yeah, I saw another uh, interview you did where you were talking about being on a lot of TV and film sets and stuff when you were young, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, was, that wasn't that was because of her, but uh, at that time, uh, she was living in L.A., but I, I was getting into these places through other means. But uh, the comedians that she introduced me to, it's mind-blowing. Like, I got backstage with Andy Kaufman. Holy I shit. I got uh, backstage with Gilbert Gottfried. Oh, he's uh, awesome too. Yeah, he comes here still. Yeah, yeah, and, and just you know, th and there wasn't that many female comedians back then, to be honest. Uh, yeah, you know, so uh, she was really, uh, uh, she was friends with uh, Sandra Bernhardt. So I took her out to dinner one night, and it wasn't a date because she was a lesbian, but it was uh, it was really cool, you know. And yeah. she had just got the part in um, uh, that De Niro, Scorsese, King of Comedy. Oh, uh, okay, okay, yeah. Sandra Bernhardt. Yeah, yeah. She tied up Jerry Lewis and <laughs> did a sort of slinky sex thing. That was really funny. But, you know, it's it's just luck, you know, in, in a weird way. And, and then L.A. was my mom moved there, and she ran away from my dad with this actor guy, Jeff Cooper. Mm -hmm. So part of the divorce that ensued or the agreement that ensued was that I got to spend time down there to be with her. Like and holidays and stuff, or yeah, holidays and summers. Summertime, and nice. So most of my friends, you know, mostly Jewish friends at that time, were would go in the summer. They'd go to like Northern Ontario camp, Michi Mama, Georgian or Bay or something. Yeah. yeah, no, no, to camps. These oh, these, actually, these yeah, camps. yeah, summer camps. Okay, Hanawin was one, Manitou was the other, and I would get on a plane and go to L.A. The only place that my contemporaries would go was to be Miami for Christmas, you know, yeah, like, wealthy, wealthy Jews that would fly to, you know, to Florida. Or Disney and World no one ever talked, like LA was just such a non-known entity in my life. And then I had this love of show business and boom, I put it all together in my head and, you know, the studios were there, everything. Like Sunset Strip blew my fucking head off when wow. I first saw it. Uh, so it was very sort of romantic for me, you know, the whole scene was very romantic and oh. it changed. And again, I probably caught the last few years where LA wasn't completely overrun with everybody wanting to be famous. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can only imagine what it was like in the fifties and the forties. It must've been just heaven on earth, you know? Yeah. Way more but, opportunities. Yeah. Well, not just that, just, just less populated. It, it's like a paradise that hadn't been discovered. Like the, the Eagles wrote that song, uh, uh, last, I think it's called the last, uh, last resort anyways call it place paradise kiss it goodbye you know which is very true and people, it's all about people will LA. come eventually yeah. yeah the song it's on hotel california it's about sort of how la was like this sort of last cool place that was sort of undiscovered and mm. then it became discovered and you know it's still great Don't get i was that. gonna say i still want to go there i've never been and it's yeah. always been big on my i like a lot of musicians who come out of southern california and yeah. uh so, no, no, it's still great, but I'm just imagining even before I, I uh, you know, years before, like decades before when Sinatra was there at Palm Springs and those guys, like that must have been just something. Yeah, like a utopia. Time. I'd love to go back in time to that, you know. Yeah, man. Vegas, you had the Rat Pack and That'd be so movie cool. stars were movie stars. It's just different now. I'm yeah. not saying it's worse or better, but it's different. I'd say it's maybe a little bit worse. <laughs> but you, you well, they weren't that. making so many reboots back then, at least. Yeah, well. Um, it's all it's all about money, man. It's oh, dude, money. it's always about money. Yeah. Well, no, it's it's funny because the you know some people ask me the difference between the, the states and Canada, and it's hugely different, right? Oh, worlds apart. Right. Yeah. It, and the, the thing that separates it was when Kenny versus Spenny was uh, Comedy Central bought into it, and then Kenny and I got to have the experience of being a product in the in the promotion machine, mm -hmm. and you got to yeah, see how like? it ran. And you know this is what America is good at. This yeah. is their call. They know how to export their culture, you know. And it was fascinating to see because there's nothing like it in Canada. And I'm not saying again whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's a subjective thing, but it's completely different, you know. Was it overwhelming at first? 
it was cool. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, you were super into that. You know, anyways. the yeah. upfronts, and they'd have a limo pick you up, and Damn. you'd go and party, and there'd be all these stars there. But it was a machine. It was like, you know, and they'd drag you up on stage, and they'd go, yeah. Uh, at that time, it was uh, the USA Network was, you know, so we okay. were there with the USA Network people, and but all the other networks were there. And you look over there, and there's Jon Stewart being interviewed by the Hollywood Reporter. And it was just kind of, you know. I always dreamed about going to the, I've changed now, but I, you know, going to like the Academy Awards or something or the People's Choice Awards. How cool would that be? Just I've always just wanted to be on a red carpet or like a, a premiere for something, you know? Yeah. So it was, it was like that, but you, you got a sense of the America, Americans genius for promotion and, and, and selling products and realizing quickly, often too quickly that something isn't going to make money. So it's gone and you move in the next thing. It, it's, it's an industry. It's a real industry. Well, and it worked well for the show because you guys did seven seasons. So. Well, we didn't do well in the States. We, oh, no. And that's a whole other conundrum uh, story because the guy that ran Comedy Central uh, was Canadian at that time, and uh, Doug Herzog. And we had heard uh, that he hated us. He knew us because he was Canadian from Canada, and he thought we were vulgar and not funny and whatever. Uh, so the only reason we got a show was because Matt Stone, more Matt than Trey, uh, they have leverage at that network. They they basically South Park created that. Aren't network. they equally vulgar and pushing boundaries too? Though it seems kind of strange. But it doesn't that... matter. It's whoever's in charge. Yeah. Right? That was so his so opinion. he he strong armed us to get on the air. But once we we're on the air, uh, we had two things against us. One, it was a co production, so it wasn't like a Sarah Silverman show, which is a full on. Uh, it's her vehicle. Comedy. Well, no, it's a it's a Comedy Central show, right? So they're going to push their show, not one that's half Comedy Central, half. Uh, I guess it was showcase, oh, yeah. uh, you know, so that was going against us. Then you've got the head of the network who didn't like it. So when the first time that we aired there, the ratings were for a first time show that had virtually very little promotion. You know, we just weren't, we were so small, so insignificant that they're not going to put a lot of money into it right off the hopper. And then it just went from a pretty decent opening to they kept changing the time slot uh, and no promotion. Never good. And so it just got, and then they just fizzled said, out kind of. Yeah. So but you guys did okay. But, but we were already we were pretty big here. That was season four for us. Remember? Mm. So, uh, but you know, you you get holy fuck, Comedy Central. We were going to parties, and there's Sarah Silverman, and there's John Stewart, and it's like, what the fuck? How did this happen? Yeah. And so you get delusions of grandeur that we're going to somehow you know be with these people, and our careers are made. But it, you know, it just doesn't quite exactly work like that for us. Well, that's actually kind of ties into a question I wanted to ask you about the show. Um, I think I know the answer now, though, which was. I've always felt, obviously, the, the first season was very different than the second season because you guys were on CBC. It was a lot more reeled in. It wasn't really vulgar in any way. The humiliations were clever but not disgusting or whatever. And uh, then you guys get picked up by Showcase, and it seemed like no, as the I'll season... You, here's, what it, here's what it was. It, we got... We'd never done a TV series before. We did a movie together, Kenny and I. We've made, Pitch, we right? made yeah. little funny movies ourselves just for our own uh, gratification. Yeah. And... Uh, so the show uh, gets picked up in the States by USA Network, okay? And, and then we start shooting the pilot. And this is before Comedy Central and all that. This is like the very, very early on, yeah. very early on, before even Canada is interested in the show. So they buy the show, which was funny to us because it was the worst pitch meeting we did all of them, Paramount. You know, we did all Warner Brothers. We pitched everywhere. Will Smith was uh, the company they bought. They bought into us. Oh wow! So we felt like, holy fuck, we yeah, that's, that's a big happen. name. So the worst pitch meeting was the USA Network. It was a, a Asian fellow named Stephen Chow who just sat there, stone faced. <laughs> and you want to make him laugh in a pitch meeting? Yeah, of course. To sell you're a comedy, comedy show, yeah. Right? And uh, every other uh, meeting was like high fives. You know, we're gonna they're gonna love it. They loved it. They laughed. <laughs> And it turns out that Stephen Chow's the one that said yes. So, so weird. So they give us money to do a pilot. And it's just a classic thing you hear about America. All of a sudden, we're in the middle of the pilot. The notes start coming in. <laughs> notes. Oh, we never done TV before. And so they didn't get it. They, they, they were thinking Spy versus Spy, if you remember Spy versus yeah, Spy. Yeah, Mad, Mad, Mad Magazine. Magazine, yeah. So they said, you know, Kenny does this to you, then you have to do that to him, and then he'll do this to you. And that was not what we did. Yeah. It was good versus evil. That's more what we were into. Yeah. And so they pulled the plug on us in the middle of the pilot. Damn. So, so that's like... That's cold. You get the dream, <laughs> and it's just pulled away from you. Uh, Kenny and I both went to film school, uh, and we finished 
the series. We did it anyways. We finished it. So we had an episode. We gave it to a guy named John Moranis, who was, worked for Alliance Atlantis. And I had used to deliver mail to him when I was a production assistant, right? And he was just a good guy, good friend of ours. And uh, But he, at that time, was running. Uh, he was a lawyer, but he was working for... Uh, Alliance Atlantis, and he saw the pilot. I don't know how he got it. Maybe I gave it to him. Maybe Kenny did. I don't know. And he almost threw up laughing. That's the. I don't know if you've seen the pilot. That's the one. Uh, is where it, I vomit keep... on the. I, I'm on the by the beach. And is I, it gaining more weight? That yeah. One? yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, I've seen them all actually. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, uh, so I, time passed. Kenny and I are living pretty hobo existence in L.A. We've <laughs> we've lost everything that we thought the we had. The dream is over. The dream is yeah. over. And then we get a call that he had sold 26 episodes to CBC. And we're like, Fucking we don't even know that that's a, a crazy amount of episodes. Like, you know, 13, you know, yeah, nine. Yeah, a more normal season. Right. Yeah. So this is like, okay, we're thrilled, right? You know, so we fly back to Canada. And so what you're talking about that first season wasn't so much because of CBC's creative influence because they essentially had none. They, there was nobody ever around from the network, yeah. which was, again, the difference between Canada and the U.S. I don't know what it is now, but that's what it was. So the, the, um, the tameness comp comparatively to the later episodes was more just a manifestation of us not knowing how far we could go Oh, interesting. You know, every show, season one, you're finding your feet. You're finding out what every show. I mean, look yeah. at the early first ep, first season of Seinfeld. It's almost unrecognizable. That's very true. Right. And they were lucky because uh, Littlefield liked them or whoever was in charge at NBC. He loved Seinfeld. So he let the show grow. He didn't ax it, which is what would, ha would happen to us, what would happen to most shows if they don't immediately break out. Yeah. So um, so that and so when the show got mean, really mean, much meaner was actually when Matt and Trey became involved. And uh, Kenny uh, got a gig writing on South Park. And that to me, I mean, you'd have to ask him, but that to me was when he became just <laughs> crazy, <laughs> intolerably mean. And uh, <laughs> without any remorse that that, that became the shtick you know, how can I fuck Spenny and make him look like an idiot? You know, that, and, and it worked and people liked that. And, and, and the similar experience was showcase. And by the way, we get canceled on the CBC because uh, we, we created a, we had, we did this ourselves. We made an ad, a Kenny versus Spenny ad, and they ran it, which was pretty racy for CBC. And they ran it in the, in the toddler block. What? In the morning. And so the, the old lady started complaining. Oh, of course. That, that's probably yeah. sexist. The old, whatever, the, yeah. the ages. Sen I can't even talk anymore. It's, no, I you know. can't say anything right. Uh, they started complaining. So that's when we they took a look and say, well, who are these guys again? <laughs> what are they yeah. doing? <laughs> what? <laughs> Get them the <laughs> fuck out of here. I literally, we were on right before the CBC network news. Yeah. So if you think about our show, the last thing would usually be me doing a humiliation. Yeah. So it'd be like me with my head in a <laughs> toilet trying to bob for apples. And then two seconds later, and Peter Mansbridge yeah. with the news. It's so, a weird slot for you guys. Yeah. And it, I just, I, you know, you'd have to talk to them, but I think they were just completely derelict in their duty or, or that was just the way things worked. But most shows die when, even in Canada, when you're, you're axed, you're axed, and we done, you know. Yeah. Uh, what was it, 20, what did I say? 26, 20, 26 it was, yeah. episodes. But uh, Showcase, we, we had garnered enough of a following, and somebody there was clever enough to, you know, to see that uh, we had a following, and they picked us up. But that's very rare, very lucky. So then, I guess, two, three years later was when it was just getting progressively. That's what I was going to say. It got more and more crazy <laughs> as the seasons went on. Well, yeah, you kind of, you know. So people expect, I guess. To some degree, you always got to keep something new. Well, I, I edgier look at, like you're a wrestling guy, right? Or, I'm no, not, but not I was going to ask you about that because I know you're huge into wrestling. Yeah, so so wrestling, if you follow the uh, you know the classic babyface heel thing, which is what wrestling really was until the Attitude Era, and then and then the bad guys became the good guys because mm. the the kids like that, you know, yeah, the F U to Edgy. authority, right? Uh, so I see myself as a reverse heel. So in another time, I would have been the, the good guy that people cheered for. Yeah. But now I'm the lame guy that everybody hates. So what I did comedically was I said, okay, you want to hate me for that? I'm really going to lay it on and I'll start lecturing about gorillas and saving. I'll be the <laughs> politically correct, you know, knob, which is a real legitimate part of me, by the way. So 
That's what happened. And that's how, to this day, that's how I see myself. So it, it's like in the old school wrestling, when a heel would come into the arena and the crowd would pop and they'd start booing and throwing things, that guy was doing his job. Yeah. So if people are hating on me and trolling me. love to me, hate you, yeah. Then I'm doing my job. Yeah, that's, definitely. That's what it is. That's, you know, too bad for me that I don't get the glory, but, you know, that's my job and it's honest and I'll just, I'll, I'll egg them on. Well, speaking of trolling, I was going to ask you if you had advice for people who deal with the kind of trolling that you do, because even your yeah. your positive fans that like you will sometimes troll you just because they think it's part of the, the well, shtick, you know? The, the truth is, and, I, you know, people could say that I'm bullshitting or making it up. Really, uh, I can't put a number on it. 80, 90, 90% of them are, are fans, mm -hmm. and they're channeling Kenny. And I know that because if I ever reach out to them uh, in a comment you know, uh, oh, spend it. Just kidding. I love you. Yeah, 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 we love you. You know, but then there's some people who I annoy with who doesn't, right? That's yeah. just, that's just what it is. So you just learn to, you learn to work with it and go with it. And if I, a reverse heel, okay, I can get my head around that comedically. Yeah. And it's honest. So I do it. That's a good approach. Honestly, that's a very healthy way to look at it. And I've seen you. And but, but, but let me just say this because you were talking about here's my social, you know, the thing that people hate about me, but you know, me getting bullied on a TV show as an adult that I signed up for is completely different than some poor kid who's got a sexual identity issue being bullied, uh, you know. Or a they're, youth they're, in they're general, two separate yeah. Things. I, I tried, I reached out to the Globe and Mail to, because I, I was sort of early, I felt like I was early on into this trolling phenomenon because people were attacking me and I said, you know, and I knew that there were serious issues about trolling that weren't about show business and comedy. They were kids bullying, bullying other kids and, stuff, yeah. and suicides and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tried, I said, I'd love to write an opinion piece about it because I, I thought I've got a good, interesting perspective on it. And it never happened, but uh, I just want to separate out those two. I don't, I don't apologize. I don't feel bad about it. I don't, I ask for it. I egg it on. Yeah. So there's you a know, project you're working right, on. Yeah. But, but you, you have to separate that out from the actual bullying. And, and, you know, frankly, the technology, uh, just makes it very easy for idiotic, stupid people to, uh, to be, to be that, you know, and it, it never existed when I was a kid, anything like this, you know, yeah. you can have a platform where you can reach out and publicly humiliate faceless people. people behind a keyboard. Yeah. Well, almost all of the trolls are, they're not, they're not the real picture. They're yeah. It's all bullshit accounts. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, yeah, it's really weird. and But the best thing with any bullying situation is just always remember that the person's probably an insecure fuck and this is how they're trying to bring you down to their level, you know? Yeah, but that requires, you know, uh, security on your part, that you're secure within yourself. And I'm all those things, but not everybody is, especially young young kids. So I think that oh, yeah. and you look how it's affecting politics, that there needs to be, in general, media education Definitely. to understand what it is, you know. I mean, look what's happening. You've got... To, Russians interfering with elections. I mean, it's, Trump tweeting every twenty minutes. You know, it's and it, and but is there is there a course in university or 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 in high school that puts it all into perspective? You know, that how much lying is on this stuff? And yeah, the bullying and all that stuff. So Social it's this media tremendous uh, technology that can be abused, and if you don't understand it, you know, you can commit suicide. I mean, yeah, you can get some dark shit has happened. Yeah, yeah. So. Anyways, I think there needs to be a, a, a higher level of uh, understanding of the technology, what it's capable of, what it isn't capable of. Well, and social eventually it'll get there, but you know, the sooner the better, probably. Social media exploded so fast when you really think about it. It's like only the last 15 years. That's insanity. Yeah. Basically, Facebook blew up like 2004 or something, I think. I know, but it, and it's constantly, it's like, it's just like any criminal enterprise, you know, they always find a way to abuse the system, yeah. whatever that is. And, and it's happening to a degree now where, it can undermine democracy. Like, wow, you yeah. know, it's, you know, that's a different kind of bullying, I suppose, or, or, or yeah, I guess bullying, you know, it's... It, it is kind of, yeah. And it's complicated. And there's a lot of aspects and arms to it. And, you know, it'd be nice to just have people understand it a bit better, yeah. I would think. And I think they will eventually because that's what happens. But by that time, <laughs> they'll be doing something Some else. new problem will come along, yeah. yeah. Yeah, probably. Um, okay, well, I did want to ask you about Kenny versus Benny. If you had an episode that you'd ever wanted to do a competition that didn't make it past either budgetary costs or yeah, I wanted to do it's the stuff I wanted to do was like golf and badminton and and, or wholesome and Kenny shit. You know, properly, I think would say no, no, it's got to be something funny that sounds funny, and he was right. Yeah, but I I still would it would be one way in which I could humiliate him. 
yeah. right? Because it's really Level hard the playing to cheat, field. you know, when you're playing a sport like that. Um, but no, we, we both, I think what we were sort of the anti-jackass in the sense that they sort of reveled in their stunts, you call them, where we were more, I think, more comedically bent and we didn't like doing it, mm -hmm. which sort of sh made it funnier. Yeah, it was like torturing yourselves a lot of the yeah, time. Yeah, you know, like when we're, you know, strapped together in the 69 oh position. It that was it, ridiculous. It fucking sucked. Oh, man, I and can imagine. We both, you know, but that, but, but we, as much as we hated doing it, we knew it was funny. So it was sort of the ends justified the means, so to speak. And did you have a, a favorite episode out of the whole series? Yeah, well, when you say favorite, uh, I just, if, if I could be objective and just look at all the episodes the who can stay naked the longest is my favorite that's a pretty good one but uh you know of course octopus one uh fart, the octopus one know, fart, fart was pretty great um by the way uh, just for those of you who haven't seen the live show uh kenny's legendary uh passing of uh gas which it wasn't on the staircase it was not a fart it was a queef <laughs> what how can you queef without a vagina because it's just air that's what a queef was. Oh, so it wasn't gas from his... Right. Okay. Now, the genius of what he did was that I didn't know that. Oh, because he I, just filled himself with actual yeah, air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a queef. Yeah, that's true. It's not actually gas from your guts. Right. That's valid. But but it's still legendary that he even thought of it. Like, yeah. That's how deranged that guy is. He yeah. is a deranged person. The stuff that... His mind is on some fucking planet that <laughs> I don't, I don't want to go to. That's all I can tell you. It I, must I, be very hard to be him because you're just constantly scheming and thinking... And it, believe me, it's not just with me. It's This is how he lives his life. Yeah. I mean, he's not a bad person. I love the guy. But I'm just saying he's got a very uh, unusual mind. <laughs> um, my favorite episode, not surprisingly, uh, it was the weed smoking one. But not really because I'm a stoner, but more because it was a rare opportunity. To s oh, no worries. My mother. <laughs> put her on. Oh. Hi, Mom. Hi, darling. You're calling me during the podcast. What does that mean? <laughs> it's a good question. It's. I remember I said I was doing an interview before the the show. Yeah. Well, we're, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> hello. <laughs> say hello. Say hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, hey, everybody. This is Vince's mother. Tell them how great. Tell them how great I am and what a wonderful son I have been. You're the best son in the whole world, and I need it. Okay. Good. Aww. Mother. And you just bought me two cases of Evian water that I'm thrilled with. And I love you more than ever. I love you too. I will call you later. Okay, darling. Bye. I should I should mention my mom said uh, when I do this interview to tell you that you were always her favorite on the show. And she was yeah. always rooting for you. Well, so. it's like you either feel sorry for me or you you get a sense that I'm trying to do good even though it's virtually impossible. The world is so screwy right now. I, I can't even believe it. I really can't. Oh, it's nuts. I'm um, sorry. Just to get back to what I was saying, um, yes. the weed episode was my favorite, not because of the because I'm a stoner, but more because it was a rare opportunity to see you and Kenny actually acting like friends yeah. and really having you know a great time laughing it up. And then you lose the weed and the whole thing. Uh, humiliation of you guys being in the bath together at the end was pretty great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't have a great memory of a few episodes. <laughs> that would be one of them. But um I, I mean, my, my position on weed is that it should, it's, I'm okay with it being legal and all that, uh, and going to jail for weed, you know, it's just ridiculous, especially with alcohol, oh. which is, I think, a far more uh, destructive drug. Anyhow, um, I've but always I'm, said also, the same. I'm also annoyed by the, the weed culture, because at the end of the day, anything that sort of alters your brain if it's abused is a bad thing. Yeah. I don't give a shit if it's broccoli or marijuana or hash or heroin or whatever. So it's just, they're just a little too excited about it. You know, it's, that's what I think. It's like, fuck off, you know, 420. Like, <laughs> shut up. That's Have hilarious. a drink for Christ's sake. Just, uh. You know, just smoke a joint and shut up. It, it's not, it's not a good, it's not, it, 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 in and of itself, and now it's everything. It cures, you know, hemorrhoids. CBD is CBD. all you hear about. Yeah, I don't even believe any of that stuff. It's I, the new snake oil, I guess. It may be true. I'm not a get. I'm not. Don't you know? Don't get mad at me. Oh, actually, get mad at me. I think the science holds up from what I've heard. I'm not a scientist though, so you never really whatever, know. Whatever. They just like get high. <laughs> they just want to get high. Fuck them. Yeah. Anyways. Oh no. So you don't smoke weed? I take it. 
No, the Close last time, I mean, I did when I was younger and it was like weed from Mexico that had like seeds in it. And yeah. It's like nothing compared to uh, this. And I, I know this because I actually with Brandon Bird, we were on the road and we usually do meet and greets after the show. And he said, well, we're in Vancouver and my buddy has a dispensary and we're going to do it before the show in the afternoon. And you're going to go down there and it's cool. It's dispensary. So I was there with Caveman and... Uh, Tyrone from the Trailer Park Boys oh, and nice. Brandon. And there was just this pressure on me to come on. You're in Vancouver. You haven't smoked in years. So the, the motherfucker who ran the place gave me a two and a half gram dab in oh one what? bong toke. That's fucking insanity. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't perform that. Well, it was funny because you know, I was high for 48 hours. <laughs> Brandon told me that it takes him three to four months to smoke what I just did in one toke. Holy shit. And the guy screwed me. Like, he screwed me. So Brandon calls me. We go, we got to go to the show. And I go, I, I can't. <laughs> I mean, I'm supposed to play music. I, there's no fucking way. And he goes, well, then you won't get played. I said, I'll meet you in the lobby. So, um, <laughs> so I went out on stage, and there was my guitar in the stand and I looked at it and I looked at the crowd and I said no. And then I walked up to the microphone and I just told the story. And I'm telling you, they had a better time <laughs> listening to me talk about what happened to me probably than they ever would have with me playing music. So I got that's paid, hilarious. I got paid, but it was, and, and Brandon got this guy to apologize to me. Well, that's pretty fucked up what he did to you, to be oh, honest, it was, like. It was hard. I don't even really mess with dabs. It's funny, you were saying you used to smoke the Mexican I didn't even shit. know what it was, it's a dab. How, it's a dab. It, I didn't know what it was. Yeah, it's like resin or something, or they it, call whatever. It, it just sounded something. like nothing. Dab. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll do a dab. And I, <laughs> they knew that I didn't. They were. They were. You know, they're not gonna screw me over. And it wasn't Brandon. No. It was this one guy. He he walked, and I should have known. It was like an acetylene torch, and a bong, <laughs> and I'm in this room, and he just basically. You know, I was gonna try a little bit, and he just like. Oh my just, god. And then uh, Sam, who's sort of into that culture, he, he knew exactly how screwed I was. So he put his arm around me, goes, dude, you're going to have to sit down. This is going to be crazy. And you must have coughed me. up a storm, too. Eh? What? You must have coughed up a storm. I did. I got a joke out, but that was before it hit me. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> but uh, I've got a video of it, believe it or not. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I would love to see that. Yeah. No, you wouldn't. No? Well, you're too much of a mess. Uh, well, uh, it was just me taking it in, and you see the guy do it. If it's as huge as you say, people would love to see that on social media. But yeah. hey, it's your it's private time, huge you know. As they, I, you know, it's as huge. I mean, this is I, I don't I know what a dab was. Never mind a two. Well, dab's supposed to be like that, you know. Yeah, no, no, no. It was like the, like this long, and it, what? Yeah, he fucked me. Yeah, I'll say, Jesus. Okay, at this point in the episode, we're just going to need to pause for a second because the aforementioned Brandon Bird actually managed to send me the video of Spenny doing this monster dab. Um, so if you're just listening to this episode, you may want to check this one out on YouTube. Uh, but don't worry if you're just listening because it's only about 40 seconds. We'll be back to the episode in just a second. But for all you Kenny versus Spenny fans out there, um, this is basically like a mini humiliation. So enjoy. Uh, Spenny takes it like a champ, though, surprisingly. And Sam Losco from the Trailer Park Boys is in the end of the video as well. So uh, you guys got to see this. Sorry, Spenny. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> You ready? Yeah. Don't, 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 don't. Take it off, take it off, take it off, take it off, take it off. You got it, you got it, you got it. Keep going, man. Keep going, Spenny. Yo, record, man. Come on, Spen. That was pleasurable. I got a stink tonight. That's where I'm hitting it lately. That hurt my fucking throat. You still got a lot of that. Come on, Spenny. You can do all the rest of the Spenny just smoked a two gram dab. Sam. Here, I'll finish your bowl. Yeah, do it. Do it. Finish it. Finish it. Spenny pussy. I'll finish your fucking bowl. He just did a whole slab, bro. He just smoked a slab. Spenny, how you feeling, my brother? Well, I feel like putting my pants on head first. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, we'll wrap things up. I know you got to get back to the show. Um, I always ask people, though, if you could have a superpower endowed upon you right now, what would it be? Invisibility. That's come up probably more than any other answer. Sure. Why? <laughs> creepy stuff. <laughs> a little bit of creepy stuff. Yeah. You could mainly only do bad things what, what, with invisibility. Why else? <laughs> well, you could steal shit. What? You could, like, rob Not a Not really. Bank. How can you do that? What, it goes in your pocket and then it's invisible? Oh, I don't know, but yeah. 
I don't know if you can make things invisible. That's a whole other thing. Yeah, I guess you could steal stuff, but that's not what I want. Plus, if you're actually invisible, I guess you'd have to walk around naked the whole time. Otherwise, you're like a floating jacket and shit, right? So well, there's another reason. <laughs> you're already thinking creepy thoughts if you're naked. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Shit, man. All right, well, normally we high five, but it's not really appropriate in COVID times. So let's just do fucking like that, you know? No, it's like the prison. Yeah, prison. <laughs> I'm on death row. All right, awesome. thank you. Yo, thank you so much for taking the time, dude. No, no I appreciate problem. it. Bye-bye. Cool.